So now I'll recover and go home. Nothing is going to happen to me. He was the first to have contracted the virus, passing it on to his daughter. Miss Susa. Oh, I don't know if you're going to in Casa. I cried terribly when I realized I had infected my daughter. Today, they've returned to the place they called home for almost a month just to say thank you to the healthcare workers who took care of them. I thank all the nurses and doctors here. When I was admitted here, they took care of me. Whatever I asked them, they give it to me. And whatever question I ask them, they answer me and... <laughs> I thank all of you. Say that my dear man, I'm going to send you this. I'm going to show you my pan. My dear man, say so. Say my pan. No, be no yemi. Boni. If be any of this, I'm going to say my pan. I'm going to come here, mommy. My dear man, say pan. I pray that you will be well. Keep yourself well. Stay away from where you are not supposed to go. Stay at home. The Greater Accra Regional Hospital was the first facility to handle COVID-19 cases in Ghana. Its infectious disease isolation center has a four-bed capacity. What management is doing now is to create holding places, you know, holding places of a best capacity of about uh, eight uh, rooms where patients who come in and are unstable can be kept there and be tested. And so far, nobody in this IDEC has contracted the disease. God has been so good to us. We are also taking all the precautionary measures. We make sure we ground well. And even when we are without the N95 and all that, we are always in a, a, a reusable mass. Plans are, however, underway for an expansion in the near future. Today, I'm going to check the vitals of the patients. We are going to, when I say vitals, I mean their temperature, pulse, SpO2. That's the oxygen level. And then BP. Thank you. Mild to moderate cases of COVID-19 have been managed at the center by a team of healthcare workers dedicated to their work. This was the temperature. After 10 minutes, her work is done and she receives a hero's welcome from her colleagues. All the patients are stable. No one lodged a complaint. Kid. But then I told myself that, well, COVID is everywhere. Most likely it may come to Ghana. And then if I can't nurse COVID patients, whose relative should come and nurse my relative if they get infected? So I realized that I had to, once I had the courage to do it, I was, I was the best person to actually do it and do it. Well. I think that we all need to wake up. There's still doubt amongst a good number of people that COVID-19 is not true. It is real. And in as much as we have... We are doing our best to stay on top of it. If you do not believe and you do not take it seriously, you make our work even more difficult. Some healthcare workers are, however, stigmatized. We should not stigmatize each other, especially those who are not with the team here, and encourage us rather to do the best we can. Because if our own colleagues start stigmatizing us, then we, we, we don't get the morale to do what we are supposed to do. For the healthcare workers at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital's isolation center, they will put in their best to ensure everyone who passes through the center recovers. Portia Gabo, TV3 News, Greater Accra Regional Hospital, Accra. All right, so we were speaking to Zubaida on the line. Got off, we are fortunate to have her back on the Zubaida, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Lisa. Great. I, I can also see you. Now, so we, we were progressing steadily when the land went up. So we wanted to find out about contact tracing. Has it started in that part of the country? Yes, um, contact tracing has started. Uh, immediately, um, this woman was um, confirmed to be positive. Um, the nurses and doctors who have come into contact with her were immediately um, asked to self-isolate. Now they are 29 of them. They are from the Tamale Central Hospital. Now these are immediate contacts that 
came into contact. I mean, immediate people that came into contact was um, the deceased. And so they had a actually been told to self-quarantine. But a few minutes ago, I spoke with the Northern Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Elizabethson, who told me that um, today they decided to put all of them at a quarantine center. Um, he didn't disclose their location to me, but then they have been put together. These 29 medical staff have been quarantined, so they are no more observing self-isolation, but of course they have been put in under 14 days mandatory quarantine by the health directorate. Contacts in the house, maybe when we get to the house, we'll get to know the kind of interaction, the people they interact with in the house, if there's somebody there who maybe came from outside or uh, have had contact with somebody else, it is possible to have uh, transmitted it to, to her. So for now, we, can, we don't want to speculate. Uh, the health officers that were involved as well to self-isolate, all their samples have been taken and they are to do self-isolation. So we're waiting for the outcome of that. Hopefully by close of day today, uh, we'll get to know if any of them have actually been infected or not. About 29 people for now, 29 of the staff that, you know, was first in the medical ward. He went through the OPD, went to uh, an admission in the medical ward, and then later was moved to the isolation unit. So we are contact with this uh, chain of people. Right, so Zubaida, before I, I, let, I let you go, if you can update us if some samples have been received so far. Yes, so um, samples have been tested at the public health and the reference laboratory. Um, as to well, well, unfortunately, Zubeda uh, was bringing us the, the answer to that question, but uh, technology has once again failed. We're unable to finish properly. But I'm sure we'll get Zubeda to bring us those details in uh, some other news bulletins right here on TV3. We're looking at some more stories now, and government says it will not take advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic to extend its first term mandate. Information Minister Kojo Pongkrum at a news conference on Tuesday maintained several countries in Africa have managed to hold elections despite the pandemic, adding government will follow suit if the killer virus persists until December 7. Some experts have suggested it might take a year or longer for life to return to normal in the face of uncertainties in the fight against COVID-19. One of the greatest concerns has been how the pandemic would affect the conduct of the December 7 elections. But addressing the press, Information Minister Kojo Ponkoma insisted government will not hide under the guise of the coronavirus pandemic to extend its constitutional mandate. Government takes note of commentary suggesting that some possible governance arrangements can be appropriate should it become impossible to hold elections in December. But the government does not contemplate any justifiable reason to seek to extend its first term constitutional mandate with the virus as an excuse without a safe, free and fair election. Kujo Pongkruma noted government will find innovative ways to ensure elections are held. The government is of the view that instead of contemplating measures that are not envisaged in the Constitution, our best energies, our innovation, our creativity should be invested in exploring how a country like ours can have safe, free and fair elections. If countries like South Korea did it around the 15th of April, Mali did it uh, on the 29th of March and I think 19th of April, uh, if Ivory Coast and Burundi and America and Serbia are all exploring how to do this, Ghana should also invest its energies in exploring how to do so and to do so successfully. Meanwhile, the Electoral Commission has served notice it will go ahead and compile a new voter's register. And now, a neurosurgeon and public health physician is advocating for a community ownership of the fight against COVID-19. Speaking at Media General's Roundtable dubbed 
60 days of COVID-19 in Ghana, Dr. Samuel Kaba Akoria called for the use of persons who have recovered from the virus as ambassadors to help tackle the issue of stigmatization. You hear everyone talking about the community engagement, community education. I do agree to that. Mm -hmm. But I want to go beyond that to what I call community ownership. What, what it shouldn't that? be my job, right, mm -hmm. to gather people from Makola and say, look, distance yourself, don't sell this here, uh, use your face mask. It should just be my simple job to look at the Makola Women Association, for instance, mm -hmm. gather them, educate them, and say, look, go and take care of your people. Beware that if one of you come positive, we we'll lock down the place. Trust me, there will be the people to champion this fight. You and I, as regular human beings, when you say something to us once, we we'll listen, but we can easily tend to forget. It's the genius that you say once, and they stick to it. But we need that kind of drum that goes morning, afternoon, evening. This, and then they are the people, they are the faces we need. I was asked a question, how do you battle uh, stigmatization? I said, look, I don't need no doctor to come and tell me about how to fight it. I need the people who have actually tested positive, okay. recovered. They are our ambassadors Excellent. to carry the fight. They are doing the we need all these people to be on board. Yeah. That's the only way we can get, so that people would understand that, look, you need to travel into the mind of the person you are talking to. Right. Every five o'clock or six o'clock, I don't remember the time exactly, in places like Spain and UK, when you are discharged, right, the community actually organizes to receive you and clap for you. Mm -hmm. right? right? It means that the community is buying in and the community is happy. Here, when we discharge people, the community is rejecting them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to start telling the story. And it, it has to be a gradual process, but it is a must if we really want to, to get these things. Also, the coordinator of global financing and technical support of UNAIDS, Dr. Victor Bampo, said Ghana ought to rely on lessons learned from the fight against HIV AIDS to tackle COVID-19 five lessons that we can learn from our fight against HIV and, and other, other diseases. One of them is the multisectorality of the response. Um, if your response is overwhelmingly health-centric, then you tend to lose out on the other sectors. Yeah. The second one is to fight stigma and discrimination. The third one is to have a data-driven response because it, it tells you what the trends How are. How well have we done in that regard? Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm, I'm not too sure that we have <laughs> used the data as well as we should because I think we've focused on the raw numbers. Mm -hmm. The raw numbers are good, but the trends are more important right. because it's the trends that tell you whether you're going up you're going down, you know. Then the last one is looking at the human rights aspects of, of these, uh, this response. And I like the, the new term that Dr. Kaba used about community, community ownership. ownership. Mm -hmm. And you see, we can learn best examples or best practice from other parts of the world. So what we really should be doing is to be doing the testing, tracing, isolating, and treating. And how do we do that? We have to involve the communities. And once the communities are part of it, when people know those who have suffered the disease, know that it's not something that, you know, overwhelmingly people come out of it, then it switches from being their disease and it becomes something that we together should take care of. Then the stigma can come down. It's, it's very important. Otherwise, we're not going anywhere. Right. The Supreme Court judge, nominee Emmanuel Yonikulendi, has rejected suggestions that his association with President Ekufado will make him biased as a judge at the APES court. Appearing before the vetting committee in parliament, the lawyer of over 25 years standing says his decision to accept public service is born out of love for his country. 
Appearing before Parliament's Appointment Committee on Tuesday to be vetted for her Supreme Court nomination, the law lecturer was clear in her denial. Nobody had approached me for anything. <laughs> and yet I kept seeing headlines. Somebody even had a headline explaining why I turned it down. And it, it was a very difficult time for me. People were saying, hold a press conference. And, and I said, what are you going to deny? Would you have accepted it, though, if you were uh, contacted? I may disagree with the honorable member, because that is a position at the level of court of appeal. And I believe that with my track record, I ought to move and aspire higher. Thank you. Meanwhile, another nominee, Yoni Kolendi, has dismissed speculations that his nomination as a judge to the highest court of the land will positively impact his financial fortunes. If my motivation was financial, I will not be sitting before you this morning because I am conscious that f from where I'm transiting as a private practitioner to where I'm headed, in this place of honor, I have um, I needed to take uh, in terms of domestic democracy. I had to have the endorsement of my wife behind me that she's willing to scale down <laughs> and and needed yes everything <laughs> because you have to cut your coat according to the size of your cloth. Yoni Kulendi said there must be a national dialogue on the remuneration for public servants, including judges, which he said will aid the fight against corruption. He also denied his association with President Akufadum will make him bias. I, I did not and do not only have an interaction with the president as a matter of candor. I have a relationship with the current president. Mr. Chairman, but it is also to the same extent that I have relationships with several other politicians. My understanding of a judicial role is that judges take the judicial oath, which is captured in this constitution. Now, if you look at the tenets of that oath, it's a sacred pledge to the Ghanaian people, to God, and to your conscience that you will do right by all manner of men who appear before you without fear, favor, or ill will, and that you will show fidelity to the Constitution, the law, and be true to your conscience. This is News 360. We are live here on TV3, also live on DSTV Channel 279. We're live on Facebook, on TV3 Ghana Facebook page. After the break, we have business with Nani Kiamen Sabrampa. Please stay with us. A very good evening to you. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Let's do business with me, Nana Ikuya Mensah Brampa. Beginning with tonight, the microfinance and small-scale loan, Maslok, has automated its operations to facilitate the disbursement of funds to members who apply for it. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, who outdoored the automation process, is elated it will promote transparency and accountability in the work of Maslok. The automation process is part of government digital agenda. It is to facilitate the disbursement and retrieval of funds from prospective applicants. It is also to enable applicants to receive funds within a 24-hour period instead of three months. The Maslock Integrated Information System is also to offer biometric cards to applicants who request for loans. Vice President Dr. Mohamed Baumia, who launched the system, asked MMDAs to capitalize on its opportunities. Uh, on this journey. In fact, once the Ministry of Finance finally launches the 
Ghana.gov platform in a few weeks, it will really mark a landmark because most MDAs are going to be onboarded. So if you want a government service, and I know Maslock is also going to be on the Ghana.gov platform, any MDA, whether it's the tax GRA or, or um, passport office or DVLA, we are going to all be on one platform which is the Ghana.gov. So if you want Maslock, you go there and all the service requests of Maslock can be made there. Minister of Finance, Ken Oforiata, who was pleased with the system, expressed commitment to promoting transparency in all government businesses. Uh, because even as we begin to um, look at issues like the 600 million we are going to disperse, people get worried about, well, is it going to be fair? Is it not going to be fair? And the beauty of technology is that it cuts across and uh, everybody has a chance to be able to do that. Um, so really want to congratulate uh, Maslok. Um, for so far, Maslok has dispatched in excess of 150 million cities to prospective applicants. Between 2009 and 2015, Maslok has issued over 75 million cities to applicants. Chief Executive of Maslok, Stephen Amwa, spoke about other initiatives to reduce burden on applying for funds. The center under the current administration has received both local and international awards in quality, competence, excellence, and leveraging technology. The results are what we are seeing today by the grace of God. There are, however, challenges such as Russian budget, delay in re releasing funds, huge deficit between demand and supply, and politicization confronting the center. Now, global remittances are projected to decline sharply by about 20% in 2020 due to the economic crisis induced by the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdown. According to analysts, this projection will affect Ghana's micro and macro economy significantly. There's more in the following report. Remittances is usually understood as the money or goods that migrants send back to families and friends in origin countries. Remittances to Sub-Saharan Africa registered a small decline of 0.5% to $48 billion in 2019. Due to the COVID-19 crisis, remittance flows to the region were expected to decline by 23.1% to reach $37 billion in 2020, while a recovery of 4% is expected in 2021. One of the biggest exports from this country is remittances. It's in the top five foreign exchange earners for the country. And remittances is that we export our people. They go and work outside, people linked to us, and they send money to build a house. They send money to take someone to school. They send money to, to send a parent to the hospital. They send money back to invest in businesses. If this pipeline for funding cuts off, we are in deep trouble. The anticipated decline can be attributed to a combination of factors driven by the coronavirus outbreak in key destinations where African migrants reside, including in the EU area, the United States, the Middle East and China. It's going to be due to a fall in wages and employment of migrant workers who tend to be very, very vulnerable in terms of loss of wages and employment to crisis of this kind in their host countries. In addition to the pandemic's impact, many countries in the Eastern Africa region are experiencing a severe outbreak of desert locusts attacking crops and threatening the food supply for people in the region. The projected fall, which would be the sharpest decline in recent history, is largely due to a fall in the wages and employment of migrant workers who tend to be more vulnerable to loss of employment and wages during an economic crisis in a host country. We're talking about hundreds more unemployed in the UK. The problem is that the pandemic, mean, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, means that everywhere in the world we are suffering the economic cost. Every country. And so Ghanaians living outside who will be sending money back home is... is it's not there anymore. 
the real estate sector is in trouble because nobody is sending money to build a house. Remittances to low- and middle-income countries are projected to fall by 19.7% to $445 billion, representing a loss of a crucial financing lifeline for many vulnerable households. In 2021, the World Bank estimates that remittances to low- and middle-income countries will recover and rise by 5.6% to $470 billion. The outlook for remittance remains as uncertain as the impact of COVID-19 on the outlook for global growth and on the measures to restrain the spread of the disease. The outlook for remittance remains as uncertain as the impact of COVID-19 on the outlook for global growth and on the measures to restrain the spread of the disease. All right, so you can get more news updates on 3news.com. That's it for Business Tonight with me, Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa. Isa has some more news updates. Isa. Thank you, Ikuya. And uh, President Tekufado has commissioned a 64 apartment new Dwala barracks at Burma Camp in Accra. The edifice is part of the barracks regeneration project. The four blocks of a 64 apartment is expected to accommodate some 64 officers and their families. The barracks regeneration project initiated by government in 2017 is to address the accommodation challenges of the armed forces. Presently, Kofado assured the officers of government continued support. Armed forces, one of my most important duties as your commander-in-chief will be the enhancement of your welfare. Over the last three years, we have worked diligently to improve the state of operational readiness of the armed forces by retooling all the services to enable you to perform your roles more efficiently and effectively. He commended the military for the effort during the three-week nationwide lockdown to deal with the spread of COVID-19. I'm proud of your exceptional diligence and vigilance in ensuring that the protocols and restrictions are outlined were complied with, especially during the three-week partial lockdown of Accra, Kumasi, Tema, and Kaswa. You have been at the forefront of the battle to tackle this national emergency, and your efforts have been laudable. You're watching the news 360 live on TV3. We'll turn shortly with the latest. From Time for some entertainment news. I'm Anita Ikea Akufu. Now, Ghanaian songstress Becca has released a new song titled Overcome to celebrate and recognize frontline workers and their input to fighting the novel coronavirus. The song is an avenue to raise financial support towards the fight against the pandemic. Becker's Overcome, which is digital, is in recognition of the efforts of all frontline workers in the COVID-19 fight. The objective of the song is to motivate frontline workers such as the medics, security services, state agencies and decision makers to keep the fight. In a Skype interview on COVID-19 360 on TV3, the singer mentioned proceeds from the song will be going into the COVID-19 trust fund. As an artist, when I do a song, it's an opportunity for me to make some money and put it in the bank, the bank so that I can, I can spend. But this time, every single proceed coming off the song, whether it's YouTube or iTunes or every streaming and downloading platforms, this money is going to be put together and sent to the trust fund, which has been set aside by the government to, to help fight COVID-19. After revealing her plans to hang her musical boot of 13 years by the end of 2020 she also gave a hint on the release of her fourth studio album i'm actually working on my fourth studio album it's ready i rebecca champon will remain an artist until the 31st of december a recording artist until the 31st of december 2020 which means up until the 31st of december this year i will remain a recording artist Doctors, necessary pharmacies. 
Now, first runner-up of the just and the TV3 mentor reloaded churches has added his voice to the ongoing discussion about how some Ghanaian artists refused to help upcoming ones. Now, churches defended his fellow Takradi native Kofi Kenata after he was accused by some people in his hometown of not doing enough to support upcoming artists in the community. Kofi Kinata has come under a barrage of criticisms from elements in his hometown of Takrade who accused him of being selfish and not doing enough to help upcoming artists from the area. In a recent interview on TV3, the musician stated that his reason for not signing or managing up-and-coming artists is due to the experiences of other musicians who took that path. The caliber of the industry we find ourselves in. Sakwade will take somebody, they will say, hey, Sakwade is sitting on the person's talent because he's a young artist. Sakwade wants to tap into his fan base, blah, 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 blah. Sakwade will leave the person. And hey, Sakwade doesn't want to help. That, that is what we are doing here. So if you look at what they are doing, you will not even go there. People will be walking up and down, walking just like that with no bicycle. You try to go and help the person and you get people saying stuff into their ear. And why don't they buy you a car? Why don't they do this for you? If I want to send you a car, why don't you buy a no car? Hi, hi. However, speaking to TV3 Entertainment, churches came to the defense of Kinata. I've known Kinata for a very long time before God a man. Kinata is a very kind and hearted person. Obiansu ya Obianu. He has helped a lot of Takrari musicians without collecting them any penny. Kinata, you good. You never buy any bit of my you never buy any so you, but me want to tell you, you sabotage buy any day. What about this big brother Takrari? I mean, what about me da? Interesting times, I should say. But that's it for entertainment right here on News 360. Have a good evening. Elsewhere in the world, the Chinese city of Wuhan is drawing up plans to test this entire population of 11 million people for COVID-19, state media report. For a while, it seemed like life was getting back to normal as schools reopened, businesses slowly emerged and public transport resumed operations. And there's more on that particular one on 3news.com. But that's all from us this evening. Remember to stay safe. My name is Aisha Yakubu. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Issa Mori. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Hell